Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 14, or to the third, The Collapse of a Dream. Thanks again for sticking around. We are now on episode 14, and if you've listened to all the episodes until now, and the three prologues, you've endured over eight hours of me droning on about long-forgotten German rulers. You definitely ooze stamina. I also need to make a correction. Last episode, I said that during Otto III's first expedition to Rome, Crescentius had appointed a priest as Pope John XVI, who we know literally nothing about. No name, no background, nothing. Well, on further review, I realized that the reason he is so obscure is because he did not uh, exist. Note 1166c of the Regesta Imperii, where I got this nugget from, is, to use a technical term, bollocks. The author struggled with counting Pope John's beyond the number 15, so he invented one to make his failed math set up, and I fell for it. Ugh. And that also means that Johannes Philagathos, the anti-pope Otto III had mutilated and deposed, was John the Sixteenth, not John the Seventeenth. Not that he much cared about that additional indignity. Apologies, and I will now be super vigilant to avoid such mistakes in the future. But no promises. Let's pick up our teenage hero where we left him last week. He had come down to Rome for a second time, to bring his cousin, Pope Gregory V, back into the holy city, from where he had been expelled by the prefect of Rome, Crescentius II. Otto III had besieged and captured Crescentius, had him beheaded, thrown from the walls of the Castel Sant'Angelo, and finally strung up by his feet at the gallows of Monte Mario. He then embarked on his most ambitious policy, the restoration of the Empire of the Romans, which was actually more an attempt at copying the Byzantine Empire. He organized his court and administration along Byzantine lines, awarding fancy Greek titles like Logothete and Strategos to his German senior aristocrats and prelates. He even had a Prefectus Navalis, a Lord Admiral, who sadly had no fleet. He also began to style himself as a Byzantine emperor. He dined alone at an elevated semicircular table. If you take a look at the most famous image of Otto III, the one that I use for the artwork for this series. You see him clean-shaven, with a Byzantine-style crown on his head, much larger than the figure surrounding him, sitting on a throne, looking into the middle distance. Now compare that to the picture we have of Otto the Great, his mighty grandfather. Otto the Great is shown as an imposing man, but similar in height to the people surrounding him, including the figure kneeling in front of him. He has flowing locks, a beard, and if you look closely, you can see his chest hair, like the mane of a lion that he was so proud of. Clearly, times have changed, and the emperor had distanced himself a long way from his Germanic roots. There is not a shred of the primus inter pares in this ruler. And at the same time, as he presents himself as the all-powerful emperor, ruler of the whole world, his life as an extremely devout Christian begins. He makes pilgrimages to shrines where he humiliates himself by walking barefoot in rags up mountains or into cities. The first of these pilgrimages leads him to the Monte Gargano in Puglia, southern Italy. The Monte Gargano is the spur of the boot of Italy, a mountainous peninsula that sticks out into the Adriatic. In a cave near the top of the mountain, the Archangel Michael is supposed to have appeared to the local bishop. The Archangel Michael is the one who, on the Day of Reckoning, will divide humanity into those who go to hell and those who will rise up to heaven. Clearly a good guy to be on the right side of. Otto III climbs the mountain on his bare feet, wearing a hair shirt, regularly declaring himself unworthy and a sinner. Only a few weeks after his return from Gargano, he takes his friend, the Bishop of Worms, and locks himself up in a holy cave near Rome to fast and pray. That is followed shortly thereafter by another pilgrimage to a nearby shrine. His religious fervor will become a constant feature of his life from now on. He maintains a punishing fasting regime, where he sometimes would not eat except for Thursdays, and is likely to have worn a hair shirt all throughout the rest of his life. Just for those of you who do not know what a hair shirt is, it's a garment woven from tough animal hair, usually goat, that is really, really uncomfortable. 
Some extreme penitents would weave in pieces of metal or glass to make the process even more painful. His next great expedition is to pray at the grave of his old friend Adalbert in Gniezno in Poland. You may remember that Otto's friend and spiritual mentor Adalbert had been killed by the Prutzi, the ancestors of the Prussians. After his death, Adalbert had almost immediately become revered as a martyr by the people in Poland, in Hungary, in Bohemia and Germany. Maybe with some nudging on by Otto III, a synod in Rome formally canonized him as early as 999. Otto III arrives in Poland in the spring of the year 1000 and is welcomed by Boleslav the Brave, Duke of Poland. Boleslav now really pushes the boat out big time for his important visitor. He has his soldiers and nobles arranged in long columns in a field like an enormous choir. His subjects were told to put on all the bling they could find, cloth embroidered with precious metal, fur and shiny armour. This event is basically the Polish equivalent of the field of cloth of gold. But it's also much more than that. According to Polish chronicles, Otto III found what he saw far exceeds the rumours he had heard of Boleslav's wealth and power. And then, upon consultation with this great man, Otto III declared that such an eminent man could not be called merely a count or duke, but should be elevated to the royal throne. And then, taking the imperial diadem from his head, Otto placed it on Boleslav's head, in a bond of friendship. And then he gives Boleslav a replica of the Holy Lance, with a small shard of the nail of the cross in it. The German chroniclers are not completely in line with this. They do record a splendid reception by Boleslav, a bond of friendship and an elevation of Boleslav to become a friend and ally of the Roman people. But crucially, they do not record an elevation to kingship. Now, I'm not going to unpick all this here, because if I did, the narrative would simply collapse. But do not worry, we'll get to it. Now, after the great gathering, Otto and Boleslav proceed to Gniezno, the place where St. Adalbert is buried. When he sees the city from afar, Otto gets off his horse, takes off his shoes and his imperial clothes and humbly walks into the town barefoot. At the church, he is received by the Bishop of Poznan, who guides him in. The Emperor kneels down in front of the sarcophagus of his friend and mentor, weeps profusely and prays for God's grace through the intercession of the martyr. Upon rising, Otto declared the elevation of the church of Gniezno to an archbishopric. Now you may remember that in episode 11, Boleslav's father, the Duke Miesko, had essentially given the whole of Poland to the Pope as a donation. That had already weakened the link between the archbishopric of Magdeburg, which was technically still in charge of Polish bishops. Now, by creating the Archbishopric of Gniezno, Otto III removed Poland from the control of the Archbishop of Magdeburg, for good. It also means that Poland is now separate from the Empire in terms of ecclesiastical organization, which makes it easier to become independent in its secular relationships. You see the difference when you look at Bohemia or Czechia, where the Bishop of Prague remained subordinated to Magdeburg for longer allowing the empire to integrate the Czechs, something that did not happen to the Poles. Upon leaving Poland, Boleslav showers Otto III with gifts, including all the gold and silver vessels, the goblets, the drinking horns, the bowls, the platters and dishes, the carpets, the bedding, the towels, the napkins and anything else that had been used in these last three days. But Otto declines them as too valuable and himself not worthy of them. What he did accept, though, were the 300 armed knights that Boleslav threw in as well, and, crucially, the arm of St. Adalbert. The two men are now firm friends and travel to Germany together, first to Quedlinburg, where Otto holds a royal diet, and then on to Aachen. In Aachen, the venerable capital of Charlemagne, things are getting ghoulish. Otto III ordered the grave of Charlemagne to be found and opened. 
When workmen lifted the floor of the Imperial Chapel in Aachen, they find the great emperor's last resting place. Let me now quote you the eyewitness report of Count Lomo, who was there with the emperor. He, Charlemagne that is, did not lie as the dead otherwise do, but sat as if he was living. He was crowned with a golden crown and held in his gloved hand a scepter. The fingernails had protruded through the gloves and stuck out. Above him was a canopy of limestone and marble. As we entered, we broke through this. At our entrance, a strong smell struck us. We immediately gave Emperor Charles our kneeling homage, and Emperor Otto robed him on the spot with white garments, cut his nails, and put in order the damage that had been done. Emperor Charles had not lost one of his members to decay, except only for the tip of his nose. Emperor Otto replaced this with gold, took a tooth from Charles's mouth, walled up the entrance of the chamber and withdrew again. Okay, I told you this would be a bit of a weird one. Again, I will not unpick this right now. Let's follow the story to the end, take a breath, preferably of fresh air, and look at it then. After these two exceptional events, the rest of the trip through Germany is comparatively uneventful. The only significant matter that preoccupies Otto III in Germany is the re-establishment of the bishopric of Merseburg. You may remember that the Slavic uprising in 983, when the empire lost all its possessions east of the Elbe, was blamed on the blasphemous suppression of the bishopric of Merseburg. Now the background of that suppression had been that Otto II, so Otto III's father, wanted to make his close friend and advisor Giselherr the Archbishop of Magdeburg. But Giselherr was already a bishop, the Bishop of Merseburg, and as such he was wedded to his church in an unbreakable bond. Otto II needed to suppress Merseburg in order to make his friend Archbishop. Now that suppression of a bishopric apparently upset God quite a bit, so that he helped the pagan Slavs to throw off the German yoke. Anyway, Otto III is now trying to reverse his father's error. That, however, requires the Bishop Giselherr, who is still alive, to admit to the severe allegation of episcopal polygamy, i.e. being bishop of two dioceses. Giselherr, the old weasel, had been avoiding a public review of his status with endless excuses, but had to accept the General Council review in Rome. I will not bore you too much with this, but it matters insofar as Giselherr was in no position to object to the creation of the Archbishopric of Ginesno and subsequently the sovereignty of Poland. And it matters also because that was pretty much the only thing Otto III did in Germany. Despite almost two years of absence, there seems to have been little for him to decide or to do up north. Now this may be due to the fact that actually nothing much is happening and everybody is happy. Or maybe they're not. In any event, Otto returns to Italy, where we find him again in the summer of the year 1000. The situation in Italy has not improved during his absence. Do you remember King Berengar of Italy, the tormentor of Adelheid and general pain in the neck of Otto the Great? Well, Berengar had a grandnephew, Arduin, who for some reason was allowed to inherit their family fief, the Mark of Ivrea, and that even after Berengar and his son had been locked up or exiled. This Arduin had now become the focal point of the anti ottonian party. These anti ottonians were not so much opposed to the Ottonian rulers as such, but to the Ottonian church policy. The Ottonians had, in a similar way to their policy in Germany, based their rule in Italy on the church, specifically the bishops, archbishops and abbots. By transferring land and privileges to the bishops, the Ottonians wanted to create a power base they otherwise lacked. However, the nobles of Italy and the growing urban population of Italy were pushing back. So every time the Ottonian rulers left Italy to look after their possessions north of the Alps, 
the Italians started to come back for the land of the abbots and the bishops. And every time the emperor returns, he forces the nobles to give the land back. Under Otto III, these judgments to return land had become very harsh. At some point, Otto was having a count hanged for stealing church land. Quite an unusual and deeply humiliating punishment. In the year 997, Arduin had upped the ante. Not content with taking just the land of the Bishop of Vercelli, he took his head as well. In return, by 1000, Arduin had all his lands confiscated and passed on to the respective bishoprics including the Bishop of Vercelli. But Arduin himself was still at large. And when Otto III travelled through in 1000, Arduin's son had been imprisoned in Pavia. But as soon as Otto arrived, the boy was allowed to escape, suggesting that there was support for Arduin that ran quite deep even in the Ottonian capital of Italy. Otto makes efforts to stabilise the situation and appoints a new Markgraf of Ivrea, but ultimately, the situation really remains fragile. In an attempt to tip the balance in Otto's favour, he is creating close links with Venice. He had already stood as godparent to the Doge's son and had on multiple occasions granted positive judgments to Venice in its disputes with its neighbours. Now, Venice's constitutional position is a bit unclear. In principle, it was part of the Kingdom of Italy. But since Charlemagne had tried and failed to take the city, the Venetians pretty much did as they pleased. And Venice is also beginning to build its Adriatic Empire, capturing cities along the Dalmatian coasts. And what makes the Venetians such an important ally to Otto is their fleet. The empire still has no ships at all, which is why it cannot capture the Byzantine cities in southern Italy, and there would be no way ever to conquer the Muslim Emirate of Sicily. To strengthen the relationship with Venice, he embarks on a cloak and dagger mission. One evening, he claims to be ill and retires to his bedchamber in Ravenna. He slips out in the night and boards a Venetian ship that takes him down to the Doge's palace. There he and the Doge meet in secrecy and discuss ways of closer cooperation. After three days, Otto III returns by the same way back to his bedroom in Ravenna. The next morning, he tells his friends and followers of the successful mission. What they have thought about that is not recorded, and if it was, it would probably not be suitable for a family show. To put that into context, it would be not dissimilar to Donald Trump leaving the White House in the middle of the night, getting on a Russian plane, and sitting down for a tete-a-tete -tete with Vladimir Putin and his dacha, and then, against all the odds, being returned safe and sound after three days. So, not the weirdest thing Otto had ever done, but close. Leaving the situation in northern Italy as it is, Otto III travels to Rome. His cousin, Pope Gregory V, had died very suddenly in 999, just 27 years old. The rumour in Rome was that the curse the hermit Nihilus had thrown at him for mutilating Johannes Philagathos had killed him. I'm not sure about that, my money is on malaria or some other disease that was rife in Rome. Subsequently, Otto III had appointed none other than his old friend and mentor Gerbert of Aurillac to be the new Pope. Gerbert took the name of Sylvester II. That was a programmatic name. The first pope of this name ruled during the times of the Emperor Constantine. He was the pope who laid the foundation of the relationship between the pope and the emperor. Gerbert's choice of name suggests he wanted to create a new model for the relationship between pope and emperor. The key planks of this new relationship are now becoming clearer. Otto declares the Constantine donation the fake that it undoubtedly is. He then hands over the same lands to the pope but on his own free will, and that makes the Pope his vassal, as far as the secular rule over Rome and its surroundings is concerned. And then Otto further changes his title to Servant of the Apostles and by the grace of God the Saviour, August Emperor of the Romans. That first part of the title is almost a copy of the papal title, who is 
servant of the servants of the Lord. Well, the second part is the title of the Roman emperors of old and the Byzantine emperors. In other words, Otto III sees himself as a secular ruler as well as a spiritual ruler at least equal or even above the Pope. Sylvester II then embarks on church reform. He specifically tries to eradicate simony, the buying and selling of church positions, and he forces priests and bishops to become celibate. Like many other churchmen in Otto III's circle, he is influenced by the growing reform movement that's driven, amongst others, by the monastery of Cluny. So, here we are. Otto III, whilst eating his meals alone at his high table surveying his subjects, must feel that things are very much on track. He has brought the imperial capital back to Rome. The church is being reformed in a joint effort of a pope and an emperor who are joined at the hip. He is creating a Byzantine imperial bureaucracy with specific responsibilities for different offices. And, at the same time, he looks after his soul and the souls of his people by praying and meditating. A Byzantine bride is on her way to Rome so that he can get working on prolonging the dynasty. But that was not to last. In January 1001, the citizens of Tivoli, a town just 30 kilometers east of Rome, rebelled and killed the officer Otto had put in charge there. Otto takes his soldiers to Tivoli, and the citizens quickly yield, handing over the murderers to the mother of the victim, who forgives them. Otto III is merciful for once. Not that it helped. A week later, the people of Rome rebel. The rebellion includes even members of Otto's court, like the Prefectus Navalis, his chief admiral of the non-existing fleet. The papal administration may equally be involved, given the papal reforms. Things are getting not just tense, but threatening. Otto III's palace is surrounded by an armed mob, whilst his personal bodyguard is spread out across the city in different defensive structures. The larger armies of Henry of Bavaria and Hugh of Tuscany are even further away, camping outside the city walls. After three days, locked up in the palace, Otto and his men make a desperate attempt to break out. The Bishop of Hildesheim takes their confession and says a final mass. By nightfall, Otto and his small band of friends take up their weapons. The desperate band of maybe 20 men crashes into the mob, following the holy lance glinting terribly in the hands of Bishop Bernward. And they make it. Whatever it was, either the sight of the holy relic the sharp swords of the armoured men, the figure of the emperor, or the insanity of the whole action, the mob disperses and lets the emperor pass. The next morning the situation improves a bit. The emperor's successful breakout encourages his supporters to come out of hiding. The people of Rome congregate at the tower where Otto is now holding out. From the top of the tower he makes his most famous address. Are you not my Romans? For your sake I left my homeland and my kinsmen. For the love of you I have rejected my Saxons and all Germans, my own blood. I have led you to the most remote parts of our empire, where your fathers, when they subjected the world, never set foot. Thus I wanted to spread your name and fame to the ends of the earth. I have adopted you as sons. I have preferred you to all others. For your sake I have made myself loathed and hated by all, because I have preferred you to all others. In return, you have cast off your father and you have cruelly murdered my friends. You have closed me out, although in truth you cannot exclude me, for I will never permit that you, whom I love with a fatherly love, should be exiled from my heart. I know the ringleaders of this uprising, and I can see them with my eyes. However, they are not afraid, although everyone sees and knows them. On that, the mob grabs the ringleaders, beats them half to death and throws them at the emperor's feet. Otto returns to his palace on the Palatine, but it would never be the same. His military leaders, Henry of Bavaria and Hugh of Tuscany, urge him to leave Rome and after two weeks he relents. The Imperator Augustus sneaks out of his capital in the middle of the night. 
They initially camp outside the city, hoping to subdue the inhabitants, but the army is too small, and the summer heat pregnant with disease is on his way. Otto and Pope Sylvester retreat to Ravenna. Otto requests more troops from his vassals in Germany, which arrive slowly over time. He makes an initial attempt in May-June to take Rome again, but it takes too long, and he has to go back into the mountains to avoid the disease. Over the autumn, things in Germany are getting unstable. The bishops of Hildesheim and Magdeburg have entered into an epic fight over the extremely wealthy abbey of Gundersheim. The quarrel is involving more and more of the German nobles and bishops and at times escalates into military confrontation. As a consequence, sending soldiers down to support Otto's manic fight over Rome is not high on the priority list of his vassals. There's even talk of insurrection, though the plotters failed to get support from Henry of Bavaria and whatever it was, peters out. In December 1001, Hugh of Tuscany, the main pillar of the Ottonian regime in Italy, dies without an heir. His lands are quickly split up between his relatives, none of whom is as powerful and as loyal as Hugh had been. In the meantime, some of Otto's closest friends, like Bernward of Hildesheim and his brother Tangmar, have already returned to Germany. Despite being somewhat underpowered, Otto III marches on Rome. He gets ambushed by Roman troops and retreats into the fortress of Paterno, 60 kilometers north of Rome. Otto begins to feel ill on January 11th, 1002. It is likely malaria, an illness he may have caught as early as the summer of 999. Despite his weakening state, he insists on maintaining his fasting regime. On January 24th, Otto III dies, surrounded by valuable, but clearly not very effective, relics, and by some of his companions, including the Pope, Sylvester II, his Chancellor, Herbert of Cologne, and his cousin, Henry, Duke of Bavaria. The friends of the Emperor try to keep his death a secret. Herbert of Cologne sends some of the Imperial Regalia, in particular the Holy Lance, ahead, whilst Henry of Bavaria takes command of the transport. He draws in troops from outlying fortresses as they move ahead. However, the news are spreading fast. Arduin of Ivrea breaks cover and his soldiers begin to attack the funeral cortege. Otto's friends, led by Henry of Bavaria, fight their way north for 14 days, until they finally reach the safety of Verona on February 7th. Behind them, Otto III's political system collapses. Arduin of Ivrea is elected as King of Italy and is crowned in the Church of St. Michael in Pavia. Pope Sylvester is allowed to return to Rome, but his reforms are stopped and he dies shortly afterwards. And thus ends the dream of the restoration of the Empire of the Romans. But what was this restoration of the Empire of the Romans in the first place? Was it real, or just a harebrained scheme of a very, very underfed adolescent? If you ask two historians, you get three answers to this question. I could try to give you a rundown of the main theories, but that would take me at least an hour. And therefore, I'll just give you my take. Otto III saw himself, from his earliest days, more as a Roman than as a German. Roman in this context means Roman in the same way the Byzantine considered themselves Romans, i.e. the heirs of ancient Rome. This goes very deep, all the way back to the time of his abduction by Henry the Qualsome, when his mother could only secure the guardianship by claiming that she and her offspring were under Roman, not under German law. Therefore he wanted to create a Byzantine system of government with an all-powerful emperor, a fixed capital and a functioning bureaucracy. Such a system was so far advanced from what they had in the Ottonian realm that it makes all the sense in the world to try to emulate that. Now I said last time that it did not work because he had no tax income. Now this is certainly not the only reason. There are others, such as geography, his German culture and customs, there's the role of the Pope and the emergence of the Italian city-states. But I still believe that even if all these circumstances had not been in existence, a simple, straight replication of the Byzantine model would have failed in the absence of tax revenues. What I do not know is whether Otto III realized that as well. 
it is quite unlikely he did. I find very little mention of tax in contemporary sources. Saints' miracles outweigh economics 100 to 1 in 10th century writing. So whether consciously or not, Otto III tried to make up for the lack of tax income with another source of effective political power, religious devotion. We are at the beginning of what is known as the time of the medieval piety. It is the time when people go on crusades to get absolution for their sins. It's a time when, in the true sense of the word, skyscraping cathedrals are built all across Europe. And it's also the time when the church gets reformed. I think I will put a special episode on medieval piety out in the next few weeks. Otto III's extreme devotion, association with saints and hermits, as well as his title as the Servant of the Apostles, taps into these developments. Positioning the emperor as the moral and spiritual leader of the empire is not just a metaphysical position. As history tells, the moral authority of the Pope has translated into secular power, land and armies. If Otto could have brought the power of the Germanic kings and the ecclesiastical authority of the Pope together into one person, he would have achieved something like a restoration of the Empire of the Romans even without taxes. It would be a very different empire of the Romans, but an empire nevertheless, ruled by a priest-emperor. Now that notion of a priest-emperor is also what drives his policy towards Poland and Hungary. I cannot say whether or not Otto III really crowned Boleslav the Brave as king of Poland. It ultimately does not matter, because by 1025 Boleslav is definitely king of Poland, and Poland itself a sovereign state. What matters more is the relationship between Poland and Germany. Even if Otto had crowned Boleslav to be king, he would still have seen him as a subordinate. Otto comes to Poland like an ancient Roman emperor, making a neighbouring country a friend and ally of the Romans. That makes them a client nation subordinated to the empire, but not part of it and ruled by its own king. The ancient Romans did that using their legions. Otto III does not have those. He has found a different way. He comes as a pilgrim. His devotion and his rank make him out as a religious authority. And then he hands over a copy of the Holy Lance, not the original, as a sign of both friendship and subordination. And that was enough for Boleslav to follow Otto to his, Otto's, royal diet at Quedlinburg and Aachen. Boleslav's presence there is as good as paying homage to Otto III. And that is what Otto III meant when he said to the Romans that he led them to the most remote part of our empire, where your fathers, when they subjected the world, never set foot. And a similar policy is employed towards Hungary, which we haven't really discussed here because just not enough space. Now, did it work? Well, if we look at the situation in 1002, the answer should be not really, or more precisely, a total catastrophe. But next week we will see what and who else will rescue what was left after the collapse. And we will see another priest-emperor, this time one that lasts longer and ends up an actual saint, even though he fights the Christian Poles in a coalition with the pagan Slavs. But that concept of the emperor being more of a religious ruler than a secular one, will remain the great legacy of Otto III. Now I know this was a really complex story. You may have noticed that I try to simplify things and I frequently link the narrative back to previous episodes. Please let me know whether this is either annoying or whether it would help to have more link backs. I'm trying to find the right balance here between moving the story forward and not leaving anyone behind. I'm also working hard on a new and better website where I can post more background stuff like maps, photos and additional information which may help. Please have patience, it will come. Until then, I hope you're still enjoying the podcast and I hope to see you next week. <laughs>